My feeling is that new needs need new techniques, and the modern artist has found new ways and new means of making his statement. It seems to me that the modern painter cannot express this age, the airplane, the atom bomb, the radio, in the old forms of the Renaissance or of any other past culture. Each age finds its own technique. Jackson Pollock was the first American painter to capture the popular imagination. The Pollock myth was that of the cowboy, born and raised on the plains of Wyoming, who became the star of the New York art world until his death in a drunken car crash in 1956 at the age of 44. Pollock was always controversial. His famous drip paintings earned him notoriety and abuse, but little financial reward. Yet Pollock produced a body of work which broke with European tradition and helped found the movement which made Americans the new leaders of the international art world. My home is in Springs, East Hampton, Long Island. I was born in Cody, Wyoming, 39 years ago. My painting is direct. I usually paint on the floor. I enjoy working on a large canvas. I feel more at home, more at ease in a big area. Having the canvas on the floor, I feel nearer, more of a part of the painting. Sometimes I use a brush, but often prefer using a stick. Sometimes I pour the paint straight out of the can. I like to use a dripping fluid paint. A method of painting is the natural growth out of a need. I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. In 1946, Jackson Pollock and his wife, the painter Lee Krasner, had moved to East Hampton, Long Island. The small town of Springs was where they decided to make their home, and this is where Pollock was to do much of his greatest work. Many of the other young New York painters, a generation which would become known as the Abstract Expressionists, soon followed him out there. The social life among the artists was one of continual, almost nightly, drunken, large parties. When I think about it now, I don't know how they went on in this fashion. Everyone was totally drunk all the time and was driving around in cars. The Hemingway mystique was very much in force. Of course, Hemingway's a big alcoholic. And it was the idea, I believe, that since artists did have such a limp wristed image in the American view, uh, that their manhood, by doing something as delicate as creating art or writing a poem, was threatened, and they had to com overcompensate all of them by being super macho. And they were strong. 
strong, ugly men. They weren't cutie pies at all. Uh, again, this was right after World War II, and the men had come home, and the, they were supposed to all settle down with nice families and suburbs. And I think that the uh, writers and artists uh, were men and women who didn't fit into that role at all, but didn't know how to get out of it without seeming too bizarre. Despite bouts of drinking and depression, Jackson Pollock felt at home here in Springs. In the years between 1946 and 1951, he was to produce many of his greatest works, perfecting the technique of all-over painting for which he was to become famous. In Pollock's greatest paintings, I think the energy is clearly there, that whiplash line, the gestures, etc. But there's also a feeling of being able to enter these paintings because they are big. Uh, there's, with all the energy, a great calm. It's not just a feeling of, of grandness, but also a feeling of, of intimacy and quiet. One of his greatest paintings, uh, Lavender Mist, I think is one of the most calm and lyrical paintings that an American ever painted. This place, in a funny way, is um, it's a bit inhabited with Jackson still. He felt one with this view. And he once, in fact, said that what amazed him about uh, being here in a seacoast area on an island, surrounded by water, the ocean on one side, the bay on the other, was that uh, although you looked at water and marsh, you could still, because of the flatness, have the feeling uh, of plains, even maybe of desert. So it hooked in nicely with his childhood out there in Wyoming. Jackson Pollock was born on a sheep ranch in Cody, Wyoming, on January 28, 1912. It was a poor family, and Jackson was the youngest of five boys. His father was a um, rather shy, rather weak in many ways, and unsuccessful itinerant farmer and surveyor. And in Pollock's early life, uh, the family traveled around a, a great deal. Uh, they would look for fruit farms one place and a surveying jo uh, job the next place. The mother was, even from photographs, I think you'd feel a much more powerful woman. With some interest in the arts, in terms of crafts arts. During the summer, he would generally work with his father one of the uh, areas his father had a job uh, was surveying the rim of the Grand Canyon. And I have a feeling the surveying work particularly was a big influence on Pollock's feeling for space. I think that sense of 
American space uh, scale, size, uh, had a tremendous impact on uh, Pollock's work. I also think uh, the mobility itself, uh, the speed, the energy, was all part of the American experience, and I think is not unique to Pollock, although I, f I feel that his particular image e expressed it so well. Jackson had been in trouble in school from an early age. But in 1928, he enrolled at the Manual Arts High School in Los Angeles, and shortly afterwards met another young student, Reuben Kadish. One of the worst situations uh, that young, young artists can grow up in creatively was present in Southern California. Uh, it was very repressive. It was more than just academic. It was mediocre. Uh, the, about the healthiest and most energetic thing that was taking place there was the Disney operation and uh, there was absolutely no regard let's say for uh, the energy and the vigor of what was currently taking place in France for instance uh, and uh, and in Mexico. One of the first things I think that I felt about Jackson's work is that it was energetic and it was vigorous and it and it did have a very uh, intense communicative power. When we went to museums, uh, like the Los Angeles County Museum, we didn't go see the show that the L.A. County Art Association put on, but we went down to the cellar to take a look at the ethnographic graphic stuff, you know. Their imagination fired by the ethnic art they had seen, the two boys went on camping trips together, watching the sand painting rituals of the American Indians and learning more about the native tradition. It had an energy and directness that was to inspire their own work. These are the kind of things that meant a great deal to me. Uh, the fact that, that uh, Pollock saw that I had a piece like this and held it in very high reverence really helped to cement a relationship. There was a lot that we found that we could identify with each other. At the end of 1930, Jackson Pollock came to New York. He enrolled at the Art Students League and moved in with his brother Charles and his wife Elizabeth. Well, in the 30s, which was during the De Great Depression period in New York City, I suppose we were desperately poor, but we were very happy. It was an exciting time. We weren't we had no rewarding results, but we all thought we were going to do impressive things. Uh, I met Charles Pollock, who was the eldest of the five Pollock boys, and Jackson was the youngest. When he first arrived, I thought he was the most uh, beguiling physically of any of the Pollock boys with a flashing smile, which I later learned was a ploy of his as he manipulated people. But in the beginning, I was ingratiated by him. But gradually, I soured on Jackson because I saw he was exploitative, manipulative, selfish, and lazy. His ploy was to go around the Manhattan like a cowboy, a hinting of his cowboy past. I think Jackson had a sense of the outdoors and loved nature in a general sort of sentimental fashion, romantic fashion, I should say. But he never participated in things that men in the West did. 
he was coddled was part of his problem. Jackson Pollock was clearly unsure of himself at this time and uncertain of his direction as a painter. As was to happen so often in his life, he was looking for a strong person to direct him. His first teacher was Thomas Hart Benton, the regional painter whose emphasis on the real America influenced Pollock's own work when he first came to New York. In 1935, Pollock joined the government's federal art project, where he met more experimental painters and had the chance to work with his heroes, the Mexican muralists. Diego Rivera, a Rothko, uh, Siqueiros, for one thing, they liberated artists, American artists, in terms of scale. They worked on a huge scale. And uh, the WPA artists who were doing murals and post offices coast to coast were very influenced by the Mexican way of dividing surface and composing and juxtaposing and so on. Siqueiros was one of the first artists to use enamel and industrial materials. And it, would uh, drip and so on, and uh, Jackson Pollock was very definitely influenced by uh, his uh, working with Siqueiros. The first time I met Siqueiros, one of the first things that I asked him, I knew that he'd been cultural attaché in Paris, was, did you ever meet Picasso? You know, those were stars, those were gods. We worshipped the Europeans. They opened up more possibilities to break away from the idea of the narrative kind of mediocrity uh, that we were used to seeing and being told that that's what great art is all about. Pollock and the other New York painters strove for a more abstract form of expression. Painters such as William de Kooning, Robert Motherwell, Achille Gorky and Franz Klein, a generation which has become known as the Abstract Expressionists. Many of them were given their first chance to exhibit by the collector, Peggy Guggenheim. There's where American painting got started. After all, look whom she was the first to show. Pollock got his first commission, which was to do a portable mural for the foyer of the apartment house Peggy Guggenheim lived in. She didn't own it, and the mural was portable, and uh, I saw it and, uh, shortly after it was hung, and uh, I thought this made me suspect that Pollock was a great painter. The picture seems to repeat itself all over. It's become a staple of abstract painting now. But at the time, that's what it was called, as exalted wallpaper and, and then the mural. Well, it just goes on and on. That's what made it so good. I think he needed to paint big later on because he didn't want to start with the shape of the the format of the canvas, as Cezanne had taught us all to do. And he felt long, and you can see that every paint stroke in the mature Cezanne is more or less echoes the, the format, the rectangularity. And it's, it's so uh, Pollock wanted to get free of that, so when he'd spread a canvas on the floor, as he took to doing, he didn't want to have that damn rectangle in his field of vision so soon. It was as though he wanted to find his way to it. Well, uh, Mr. Park, can you tell us how Monarch came into being? It didn't jump out of the blue. It, um, it's a part of a long tradition, beginning back with uh, Suzanne up through the Cubists, the post-Cubists, to, to the painting being done today. Well, it's definitely a, a product of evolution. Yes. Can we go back to this method question, which so many people to think is, is important. Can you tell us how you developed your method of painting and, and why you paint as you do? Well, method uh, isn't 
seems to me, a natural growth uh, out of a need. And from a need, uh, the modern artist has found new ways of uh, expressing the world about him. I <coughs> happen to find uh, ways that are different from the usual techniques of painting which seems a little strange at the moment, but I, uh, I, I don't think there's anything very different about it. Um, <clears throat> I paint on the floor, and, uh, which isn't uh, unusual. The Orientals uh, did that. As a painter, Pollock was in control, constantly pushing forward his technique. But he seemed unable to take responsibility for his own life. He turned to women for support. Peggy Guggenheim was his patron, and the painter Lee Krasner, who later became his wife, encouraged him and introduced him to like-minded painters. When I brought Hoffman up to meet Pollock for the first time, because I thought, you know, here's someone that would certainly understand the work. Hoffman says, you are very talented, you should join my class. Then Hoffman said, but to Pollock, but you do not work from nature. This is no good, you will repeat yourself. You work by heart, not from nature. And Jackson's response to that is, I am nature. The modern artist is living in a mechanical age. And we have mechanical means of representing objects in nature, such as the camera and the photograph. The modern artist, I, it seems to me, is working and expressing a, uh, uh, an inner world. In other words, uh, expressing the energy, the motion, and other inner forces. Would it be possible to say that the classical artist expressed his world by representing the objects, whereas the modern artist expresses his world by representing the effect the objects have upon him? Yes, the modern artist is working with uh, space and time and expressing his feelings rather than illustrating. I think that much of Pollock's imagery comes from the unconscious. And he accepted that and had come, had come to that as an aesthetic uh, in several ways. From, if I remember correctly, 1937 on, uh, he was in and out of analysis the rest of his life. Another thing was the tremendous influence of surrealism in, in the years when Pollock first came to New York, so that between uh, psychiatry, uh, surrealism, what he'd seen of Indian rituals in the West, uh, Pollock had pretty much uh, formed a basic conviction that the un unconscious was where art came from. Pollock got little critical recognition as he struggled to find an individual direction. Pollock was using anything and everything that he could get a hold of uh, there was a great search for uh, a new kind of excitement in materials. If you threw your paint across or whatever it was, if it brought a new phenomena into being, then it was worthwhile. Well, how do you go about getting the paint on the canvas? You, you, I understand you don't use brushes or anything of that sort, do you? Well, most of the paint I use is... Uh is a liquid flowing kind of paint. The brushes I use are more, uh, use more as sticks rather than uh, as a brush. The brush doesn't touch the surface of the canvas. It's uh, just above. Well, isn't it more difficult to control than, than a brush? No, I don't think so. I, with the experience, uh, it, it seems to be uh, possible to control the flow of the paint to a great extent. And I don't use the, the accident, as I deny the accident.
He could uh, fling a skein of paint with the accuracy of a cowboy with a lasso. And that, that cowboy business, I mean, I, I, I don't like to bring that in, but the business of uh, Jackson as a Western, and that's a part of myth, a uh, convenient myth. But he did have, he did acquire marvelous control of that stick he would use and to fling paint. You know. And then he'd use a basting syringe, a big basting syringe. Well, basting syringes aren't big. And uh, he had a lot more control than people, than the myth would have. We had as much control as you need to make good art. Quite a few artists were working on large canvases, but American artists had no uh, response critically. Clem Greenberg came along, and Clem Greenberg is the granddaddy of hype in the art world. Clem was the first person to say about an American artist, this is the greatest artist. So Clem single-handedly began to uh, open up the uh, world of publicity because Life magazine ran an article that was supposed to be sarcastic with this photograph of Jackson Pollock. And of course, it captured the imagination of the public. And definitely part of Jackson's success was his cowboy image and uh, throwing paint down and uh, reckless and abandoned and so on. It was an exciting image. It was here in Springs, Long Island, that Jackson Pollock was to spend the last 10 years of his life and produce an enormous body of work. But this art, whose inspiration sprang from the unconscious and whose purpose was to express the artist's inner feelings, proved difficult for the public to understand. Jackson was looked upon very much as uh, not only an outsider, but uh, what they would call here uh, a character. He was a man from away, but he was an artist, and all artists, uh, or any intellectuals then, were somewhat suspect. Uh, when Life magazine in 1950 came out, um, or the end of 49, with a big spread on Jackson Pollock saying, is he America's greatest painter? Uh, the local people were absolutely staggered. It was a little bit surprising when we first went in there. Here's this guy, he's bombed right out of his mind, and the canvas is so-called painting. That's laying on the floor and he had a card table with all these little uh, jars of different color paint. So he's slopping around there barefoot in the paint, and he just takes the jars of paint and he just throws them on the paint, and he staggers around there, and he's still walking in it, you know, the wet paint, but some of the jars slipped out of his hand, and the broken glass, well, that got sort of got mixed in, too, and then his feet started to bleed, but it didn't seem to make any difference. He's still slopping around in the paint and the blood and the glass. And, and uh, this thing was supposed to have been a painting when he's got done. But uh, myself, after becoming a professional drunk my, on my own, then I could see where he was painting all of this stuff, the different uh, thoughts that he had. But uh, when you really get that drunk, you mine sort of does wander in circles and I guess anything looks good at that point and uh, that was supposed to have been a great painting that he done and I think probably sold it for a million dollars now but at the time I wouldn't give 10 cents for it and I still wouldn't you know this is of course my opinion of it. The drunkenness was to become part of the Pollock myth but it was interrupted by long bouts of abstinence. In 1948 Jackson Pollock gave up drinking completely and in the next three years, produced some of his finest paintings.
Actually, Pollock's art was incredibly highly controlled, and it took him years to really perfect the ability to control this kind of pouring, splattering, and dripping technique so as to uh, give him an immense battery of effects that he could produce instantaneously. Now, people would say, well, anyone can pour that. I can take a can of paint and pour it. Now, it is certainly true, but anyone can go up to the piano and push the note C, and your C will be as good as Arthur Rubinstein's or Horowitz's. And by the same token, if you spill a little paint, that's going to be, let's say, as good as Pollock for just that little spill. What makes Horowitz or Rubinstein is the succession of accents and the control and, and, and interrelationship of these accents as they come one after another. That is what we would call the touch of the pianist. But the tone is the same for you or for Rubinstein. In Pollock's case, it's not that you can go and pour this and say, all right, that looks like Pollock. It's to be able to make the continuous line which weaves, meanders, interlocks with previous accents, which is a constantly changing story. These paintings sold for thousands of dollars after Pollock's death, but at the time, he could scarcely make enough to live on. We bought the house and, and it became a permanent residence, not a summer rental, and more and more people came out with the studio and what is now the garage and the little shed and five acres of land. It was $5,000. $2,000 we had to pay, and that was a loan from Peggy Guggenheim. And Jackson put up three paintings as collateral. Then we got the barn cleared out and moved over. He took the barn to work in, and I took the room upstairs that he had been working in. It was rough. Well, if you want really practical details, when he moved out here, his studio had no heat in it, which immediately limited the painting life of his, you know, the days in which he could paint to about seven months of the year, because the rest of the time it was too damn cold and the enamel and oil paint and he would all freeze in the barn, which was unheated, and the wind used to whistle through it. The final afternoon of uh, filming was a cold one. It was uh, at Thanksgiving, and it uh, was windy, and they came in at dusk, and Jackson went straight to the kitchen sink, and uh, he'd not had a drink in two years, and he wasn't quite reformed, so he reached under the sink and took out a bottle of whiskey, poured himself a tumbler full. And uh, the scene was absolutely astounding. Eight or ten of us here at the table. Uh, Jackson sat down at what the head of it, and uh, before anybody could say anything, suddenly Jackson said, looking at his plate and then looking at Hans, and then holding it into the table, he said, Now? And uh, there's a dead sound at the table at once, and I saw Lee at the other end stiffen, and I heard her say, My God, now what? This is in a soft voice. And then Jackson said the word now louder the second time. And finally, he then in a roar grabbed the end of the table. And as he stood up and taking the table with him in his hands, he said, No! And in the midst of all this, Jackson just calmly walked out of the house, out this back door out into the night, and I presume to the studio, and the scene was over. The tension of the filming and his return to drinking coincided with Pollock's frustration at having reached the limit of his present style. He wanted to move forward, but how? Jackson was as intelligent as could be without being particularly articulate. He was one of the most intelligent people I'd ever met in the deepest sense. After painting a shell, say, 15, 20, 30 pictures. He'd knock off and not paint at all for maybe weeks, maybe months, sit around smoking. Not necessarily drinking, either. It wasn't that he would go on a binge. Uh -uh. Uh, and then and then he'd begin painting again. Now, he never said this, but I fancied I could see this. That during the layoffs, he, came in, he got rid of his mannerisms, such as they were if they were mannerisms. 
as he says in the letter that he wrote me when I was in, the, in Paris, that uh, you know, I've been involved in a series of black and white canvases in which the earlier images have started to reappear that may give the young who think it's easy to knock out of, you know, drip out of Pollock thought, pause to think. They were very powerful paintings, and it was a show, I think, was, it was a terrible disaster when it happened because his previous drip show had been a success in a small way, and they were all, everyone was prepared for a, as much of a success so that he would be making as much as a master mason as him. Instead of which, his austere black and whites and I think during the exhibition, none of them were sold. You know, he'd done this black and white show in uh, 51, and there were some great pictures in it. 52, he'd gone back to color, and the, some of the pictures were shaky. I feel that he felt that uh, uh, he'd run out of inspiration, not because of the limitations of the technique, and he'd run out of his charge. There were still some fine colour paintings to come, but Pollock's frustration with his work, his problems with his marriage to Lee Krasner, combined with his alcoholism, meant he was never to recover his strength as a painter. Even late in life, when he was having great difficulties and he was drinking again, uh, he never made fake Pollocks. That is, he never said, I know what a Pollock looks like, so I'll whip out a few for the trade. He constantly criticized himself, and because he was so self-critical, he really reduced his output to next to nothing in his last years because he really couldn't accept what he was doing. It was in 1956 that Jackson Pollock met the young art student Ruth Kligman and began an affair with her. But I knew Jackson seven months. We lived together since the beginning of the summer. I guess it was late June, early July, July and August. During the period that I was there, he was not doing any work, although he thought about it a great deal. But that wasn't unusual, you see. Uh, when painters go through a very large surge of energy, which he had for many years, he'd done this great body of work, uh, there are shallow periods. Uh, writers have blocks. You know, he was very consumed with his emotional life. He uh, had an incredible ego. He had a duality in his personality. Very often he would say to me, uh, we'd be sitting around the kitchen table in the morning having our coffee, and he'd say, you know, I'd love for that attitude, you know, very Western, you know, there are only three artists, Picasso, Matisse, and Pollock. <laughs> and then the other side, the, the flip side of that, he would say, I'm no good, you know, I'm a phony. And that self-doubt, I think, is part of being a painter, part of being an artist. In the last months of Jackson's life, I saw a lot of him um, because uh, both he and I, and as a matter of fact, a great many other people were going into New York to see shrinks. And at first, we had a station wagon called the Flying Couch, which we used to all go into New York. And uh, then the flying couch disintegrated, and I would go with Jackson twice a week on the Long Island Railroad into New York. This was when he was having a great deal of trouble with Lee, and uh, Lee was having a great deal of trouble with him. 
and he was seeing Ruth Kligman in New York, and um, his state of mind was extremely desperate. I think that he felt that the art within him that he wanted to express uh, was so difficult to express, he had to bring it so much up from his subconscious, and his subconscious was in such a state of turmoil that I, don't, I didn't think he could maintain the degree of intensity. The edge was really where Jackson painted, in a strange way. He, he really pushed all that far, I think. Also, in his way of life, he lived that far. He was on the edge. He was on the edge uh, in terms of peril, constantly, the way he drove, the way he drank. The challenges that he would make to people uh, when drinking uh, was very much on the edge, constantly. As to his driving, Jackson uh, did more than drive when he drove. He really did a form of expression, one could say, and uh, he sometimes would express his anger by speed, or just sort of really crazy kind of driving. At that age, uh, the automobile constituted something that possibly, in some structure of some societies, it's there as a mother, and it's there as a lover, and it's also there as an angel of death. And I think that somewhere along the line, it, it became that for him. He did drink. He was an awful, awful bore. He was a trial. He was, he was continuously testing, and yet you tolerated it and you accepted it because of the other rewards. And I certainly, uh, I've had uh, students that think that they'll just go out and get themselves drunk and that'll be it and they're Jackson Pollock. I'm afraid uh, suicide and alcoholism are a, are a, uh, a very uh, sad dimension of the whole abstract expressionist movement. All of them were really uh, children of the depression as it were, but almost without exception they were very heavy drinkers. Uh, a lot of them liked cars and used cars dangerously. A disproportionate number ha had no children, so there wasn't that hold uh, on their lives. Uh, the Pollocks had no children. Um, but there were a lot uh, of, of specific suicides. Uh, Rothko's is famous. Uh, Gorky's is famous. Uh, then there would be something, a classification more like existential suicide, where a destructive uh, pattern throughout life culminates in a violent death. And there, I give us examples, people like Pollock. Uh, I think it was all, all part, of, part of a climate uh, at the time. And these men really had no great success. Pollock sold very little uh, during his lifetime. All, all of the big prices and all of the, the enlargement of reputation and all of the mythic proportions of these people occurs after Pollock's death, it can almost be measured by, the, by that night in, in the summer of 1956. Ruth Kligman had been living with Jackson Pollock while his wife, Lee, was in Paris. On the 11th of August, Ruth returned from a weekend in New York, bringing with her a friend, Edith Metzinger. After a day of tension, the three set off for a party. From the moment we got in the car, I knew it was a mistake. We were on our way. He kept stopping the car, uh, crying. Edith became provocative in the sense that she didn't understand and she got very scared. And then we decided to not go to the party. We were on our way home and Jackson just wildly started to speed. And he put his foot on the gas and Edith started to scream. And he laughed. And uh, we speeded down Fireplace Road. And that's when the car swerved. And he 
young girl came up to me and she was patting me and there was a man and I was holding his hand and, and they covered me and I made this girl, I said, go over there to where the car is and I'll be watching you and come back and tell me if he's all right. And she did. And she came back and I said, is he alive? She said, yes. I said, swear by God. She said, I can't. So I knew. If he had died of a, a liver disease, uh, it would not have been as glamorous. Him dying in an automobile accident became almost a James Dean Camus kind of mythology. That helped the romance of the great artist, the romantic artist, not to live it out, to die too young before you become old hat, you see. So uh, it also created a value structure because the paintings before that, oh, he must have sold blue poles for $3,000. And now it's priceless, but when it was sold to the Australian government, it was 2.6 million or something. Now, if he were alive, that would never have happened. But he was the first one who started the ball rolling in getting those kind of prices. So the art market was created out of Jackson Pollock's tragedy. I cannot think of an estate that was handled in a more brilliant way than was Jackson Pollock's by Lee Krasner. It was extraordinary. She was the one responsible for getting Sidney Janis, the dealer, to hold back certain paintings to get the price up on other paintings. And she really did direct everything that happened with that estate. It's remarkable. And she was, therefore, the person who really began the price escalation of um, the entire American art movement. This was Lee. Amazing. Mr. Park, isn't it true that your method of painting, your technique, is important and interesting only because of what you accomplish by it? I hope so. <clears throat> Naturally, the result is the thing, and it doesn't make much difference how uh, the paint is put on, as long as uh, something's being said. Technique is just a means of, of arriving at uh, a statement. He felt his only justification as a human being was as an artist and in his art, that otherwise he was no good to anybody, which wasn't quite true. And they carried on about Jackson not painting and all that. And he didn't paint because he wouldn't force himself. He was true. I'm not idealizing Pollock. I'm not. But uh, if anything he was, he was, he was true. Well, he's had a tremendous influence on uh, an awful lot of people. And uh, the, the best influence, of course, is, is uh, when they go out to try and find themselves. And I think that's one of the most important things about Pollock's work, actually, is that uh, it isn't so much what you're looking at, but it's what's happening to you while you're looking at his particular work. And that's something I think that he had almost from the first pieces that I ever saw. They were attention-getting, they were riveting, and they had a power that changed your character and your personality. I don't think anyone can walk into a room with his work without feeling that here somewhere it's laying there, it's latent.
Fiden Video present films on an international array of 20th century artists. Andy Warhol, the father of pop art. Well, do you think that they've shown a lack of appreciation for what pop art means? Uh, no. Andy, do you think that pop art has sort of reached the point where it's becoming repetitious now? Uh, yes. Do you think it should break away from being pop art? Uh, no. Are you just going to carry on? Uh, yes. Painter, graphic artist, filmmaker, Enfant Terrible. Real one of Andy Warhol Kitchen. And cult figure. During the 50s, various approaches to painting prevailed. Patrick Herons, Arthur Boyd's, and Francis Bacon's. Abstraction was the dominant force, and Jackson Pollock's approach was the most energetic. Life magazine ran an article that was supposed to be sarcastic with this photograph of Jackson Pollock, and of course it captured the imagination of the public. Jasper Johns presents familiar emblems and images in new contexts. Saying she was so proud of me because she had worked so hard to instill some respect for the American flag in her students. <laughs> and she was so glad <laughs> the mark had been left. <laughs> David Hockney uses still photography to make pictures of movement. You can see the city very well by air. You see all these little blue pools, and I thought, oh, that looks very nice to me. While Roy Lichtenstein turns comic books into high art. And Paula Rago provides an all too rare woman's perspective. The difference, I think, between a great woman painter painting women and a great male painter painting women is that in the case of the women painters, she's got a skeleton. From Robert Motherwell to Malcolm Morley and Christian Boltanski. Fiden Video brings to life the great avant-garde artists of the 20th century. complete catalogue of Fiden's publications, please call 0171 843 1234.